Hi there, and thanks for listening. If you're enjoying our podcast and have a recommendation about someone you think that we should have on to share their voice and journey with the world, by all means, let us know. It could be an aid worker, monastic, author, journalist, doctor, resistance leader, really anyone with some tie or another to the ongoing situation in Myanmar. To offer up a name, go to our website, insightmyanmar.org, and let us know. But for now, just sit back and take a listen to today's podcast. pleased for this episode of Insight Myanmar podcast to bring you a special guest. Quite a lot of stories to share from Myanmar over many years. May Win Maung, thanks so much for joining us on this episode of Insight Myanmar podcast. Thank you. Thank you for um, asking me and give, give me this uh, opportunity. Yeah. So I think that you're a name that maybe younger Burmese might not be familiar with and people outside of Myanmar may not as well. But for those of another generation in Myanmar, I think everyone will know a little bit of something about you and your career and uh, be very interested to check in and, and hear your thoughts now. But for those who are not familiar with your life and work and previous career, I wonder if you could take us from the beginning and share a bit about your early years growing up and then the movie career that you settled into. Yeah, I grew up in um, all over Burma since my father was uh, an army officer. So we had to move from town to town. But when we became uh, teenagers, we stayed in Rangoon and I started my movie career right after my high school graduation. So in around um, 1972. So, and then until 1993 that I left for uh, America. So around that time, I think people, uh, my, my generation may know me, I think. Mm, right. And before we get into your movie career and learning more about Myanmar cinema, let's just go back to those early years. You mentioned how you moved around a lot because your father was in the military. Actually, my father joined General Aung San's um, army. He was the the second group, I think. So it's very early. And then we, even he was not married. And then... After a while, he left army and then he was attending the university. But uh, before he finished it, his uh, younger brother joined the army. So he joined again and then he got married. And uh, when we were pretty young in my elementary er uh, era, he was with the parachuting school he at and at one point he became a uh he became the head of the that parachuting school so we live uh, very near to the air, airports and i've seen the airplanes you know flying over 
our area all the time. And in 19, and then not, uh, we, when we were in that uh, still the military, I mean, parachuting school, there was the 1962 coup happened. So we were so young, so we didn't really realize the effects of those. But I remember that um, the, there was the announcement of um, the fifty dollar, fifty jets bills, and hundred jets bill. You know that that you cannot use it anymore. So. I heard that uh, the, that my mother was uh, complaining a little bit, but um, we I think uh, we didn't hurt that much at that time. But a lot of people lost a lot uh, a lot of their monies and all that kind of stuff. And then we moved from there. We moved to a different um, military. Uh, areas and then when I was in the high school, he was we were in Mingladon, and he, he was um, G one. His position was G one, and then from that position, he was forced to retire from the his uh, military position, and then asked to move to the government, uh, mini one of the ministries. So even though he was not so happy about that, he didn't have a choice. So he, 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 he did accordingly until he, his retired age. So, and then when I was, um, after my high school graduation, I, I attended the Rangoon Arts and Science University, and when I was there, there was this um, Utang crisis. It was in uh, 1974. So he was Utang was the third UN Secretary General of the United Nations, and he worked there from 1961 to 1971. So. What happened was um, a series of protests and riots in the then Burmese capital of Rangoon, triggered by the death of Uta, caused by government's refusal to hold a state funeral for Uta. I'm wondering what Uta's funeral uh, did that have an impact on you or your father? Or was your family involved in any way in those '74 protests? No, not not to my father, but I was still a student at the university, so uh, we saw a lot of protests. And so I was not really involved, but I oversaw the the crisis and protests. And then we had to the school had to stop for a couple of months, and then we continue. So what happened was the, the the goals of the student at that time was the to get the state funeral at the old site of Rangoon University Student Junior, but it was violently suppressed. So I was just oversaw the crisis, and then nineteen eighty eight uprising happened. At that time, I finished my university already i i was working as a as an actress and it was started by students in uh, rangoon on it was happened also in it was in august 1988 and then there was um student a protest spread through the country March 12th through September 21st, 1988. So that's why it was called 8888 8, 8, 8, uprising. So many firms in the formal sector of the economy were nationalized and the government combined Soviet-style central planning with 
Buddhist and traditional beliefs and superstition. Mm -hmm. Right. And your, um, uh, your, your father joined a very different army than the Tatmada would become as the military took over and as it started to really control the country with an iron grip. Do you recall your father's attitudes or feelings about being involved in an organization that was now affecting and impacting the country and society very differently than how it was when he joined that military for uh, probably for uh, trying to gain liberation and independence? I was, uh, I'm not very sure about that because they, what I heard, what I overheard all the time was um, when the water bottle is dripping, doesn't matter, you have to fill the water bottle. That's what they, you know, were told all the time. So no matter what, how the water bottle was leaking, you have to, you, you always have to fill it. And, and so what does that mean? That what? means I think whatever I think, and, and I think also think that uh, these days as well, if you are happy or not, I think you have to follow the orders. I think mm -hmm. that's, that's mm -hmm. what they were trained. I think. Right. So you, you're not familiar with your father's opinions on how. Not, no, he, right. he didn't, he didn't express his actual feelings in front of us. So he was just doing his mm -hmm. job. Yeah. Right. Okay. So then let's go to yourself then. In 1974, you're a college student and the first real cracks in the military regime's oppression start to show. That's Uthant, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Uthant's funeral. There's a protest over where he will be buried and how he will be honored. Uh, Ne Win, the dictator at the time, uh, sees him as something of a, of a rival and doesn't really want to give him too much respect. And even though you're not so much involved in organizing these protests or perhaps participating in them, you're conscious of them going on and they're happening all around you in, in your your campus and, and fellow students and such. So was this, is it fair to say this was kind of the first moment in your own consciousness and awakening that, that something was not good with this military regime and that there was now turbulence in trying to to give some kind of expression against them? Or what, what was your, as this was going on, what was, what was your feeling and observation at the time? Yes, you can say that because people were, people were forced to, you know, stop uh, expressing their feelings, you know. And then Uta also was a, a special person for um, Burma. And then I don't know why, they had to, you know, let him honor his, you know, name and his work. So at that point, I maybe I, even though I did not really say anything about those, but that's when my, my feelings of uh, doubt of the, our military government started, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's great. Let's bookmark that for a moment and let's take a completely different track and mm -hmm. or perhaps it's not different because these these might go parallel, but let's just take a a moment to better understand your storied movie career as as an A-list actress in Myanmar. So, can you tell us a bit about how you got involved in movies, what your big breaks were, and then what roles you started to play, and maybe tell us a bit about the state of Myanmar cinema and the process as uh, as you came to be involved in it. Uh, how I started uh, my career was we used we used to go to Shwedagong Pagoda quite often, and then my my father has a friend who who knew a director who was looking for an actress at that time, so we met each other, and then I had to do some auditions, but I didn't realize that, that was the audition, so I did. I did whatever they asked me to do, and then they chose me. So that's how I started my career. And then that director, at the same time, uh, had another projects, and then, 
and then other people notice me and then and so on and so forth so that's how i got into the movie business and i was doing about um 60 films and about 30 video movies at that time and before i left to america mm, so tell us a bit about the state of myanmar cinema for those that are only familiar with ho the Hollywood version and the story of American cinema. Tell us a bit about what you know about the origins of Myanmar cinema, about the the um, the expression of the art form, as well as about what it was like trying to make movies in a state that did not have freedom at the time. At the time when I was in the movie business, there were only black and white films. So we were shooting with the films and then um, all mo no, no um, color movies were there yet. And then, but uh, around 19, um, end of the 80s, I think, or early 90s, the color films were um, started uh, in, 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 in Myanmar. So, and uh, there were movie theaters, individual theaters, and uh, at that time, and um, there were, they, they showed it at the same time, I think, Upper Burma and Lower Burma and, and into the other smaller towns as well. And... Um, the we when we when I started, there were the posters were too big, like like um, the about the three times or four times of actual you know actual uh, human sizes. But at one point, um, and also there were um, the government was importing some uh, foreign move films, and they post they they had the. They always have the small posters. So at one point, the the big the big posters are all cancelled, and everybody has to be the same. So our posters became the smaller as well, small like um, maybe I, I'm not sure about that, but like fifty by fifty by thirty or something like that for the you know try, try, uh, right angle right angle posters. And that that was, I remember that that happened when I was there, and um, and also there were um, at that time at one point there were about hundred uh, movies were produced, but uh, later uh, the, they were very very little. I heard after I left. And um, the academy um, giving ceremonies were held uh, almost every year. But right now, I think everything is stopped, you know, because of the COVID started and also the coup happened. So everything <laughs> in the movie industry also has a uh, the, no, nobody can continue their work. So a lot of hardships for the the people from the movie industry, as well as you know, the the, the rest of the country, you know. Mm, right. And how about the connections between Myanmar cinema and the military at that time? Were there connections? What was the nature of them? And to what degree was freedom of speech and creativity limited by filmmakers? Oh, there were a big, a big uh, censorship, censorship. So early, early in the movie, early movie days, there were, even though there were kind of censorship, but not that much um, strict. But when I became in the industry, the censorship at one point, censorship was very strict. You cannot say such things. You cannot um, 
wear such clothes, not 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 very low, you know, no low neck blouses or even the the big buttons. They were in you know the censorship don't don't won't allow those things and bell bottoms and all the kind of stuff. And then also in the even in the uh, tele. Uh, there was the television and Myanmar television program started and then they cannot wear bell bottoms or, you know, the European attires. But now it's a, a lot more open, I think. But at that time, and then there was a, there was an actress who was, who was a band for a, couple of years f- from performing because she was wearing something you know inappropriate they said but in in this era it is it is um nothing at all at that time so it, it, censorship was also very strict and then you cannot say things like um okay there was a movie i was involved it was called Kidiakhide means a traveler to such and such city. So actual distance from Rangoon to that city is about a, like a one-day trip. But along the way, they had a lot of problems happen. So it took them like 10 days to get that city. So that, and so when they... <laughs> When they try to uh, get the censorship pass, the 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 board the board uh, from the censorship was not very happy about that movie. So they they asked the producers and directors to cut a lot of scenes out of the movie. They thought they thought uh, it was about them because. I don't know, but uh, so they, then they, 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 they were not happy and then they did a lot of censorship f- to that movie. So things like that. You cannot express even a little hint of your um, unhappiness or whatever. To, to, if they think it is about them, they will, they will give you a hard time. Yeah, things like that. That that's one of the things I remember. And then, how did that feel for you as an artist who is working on this <clears throat> this medium of film for two decades and doing, as you said, over sixty movies and along with television shows, uh, this kind of really tight censorship of what you can say, how you could say it, what the references and inferences could be, what you could wear, the plot lines, everything else, having every, everything under so much scrutiny and, um, and, and such censorship. How did it feel for you as an artist working in those conditions? Uh, not happy, of course, and not just me. A lot of uh, people from our industry felt the same way, but we cannot do anything about it because we are under the law. So we had to walk, you know, the way they wanted us to. So even these days, even, even, even these days, the censorship is still there. And then we, you cannot express a lot, but it's a lot more flexible than before. I think, because since I'm away from there, a long time, so mm. I, I'm not sure how how things are over there. But I, I I just heard someone was complaining about the censorship. So the censorship of their art, you know. So if they if they are forced to cut out a line or two or the way they express things, they don't have the freedom of expression. As so they are not happy. That's that's what I just heard. So I think still a little bit of the. I think. Mm, was there ever a time you remember where you or other people in the film industry tried to protest this or to um, to expand uh, beyond the censorship laws, or or was it just too dangerous of an operating environment to attempt to do that? 
at that time, I, I don't know why, including me, nobody dared to express and protest about the censorship and stuff. But um, after the even after the ninety eight uprising, I was I and also everybody was involved. But after that, after the the control back, we had to sign. We had to sign then the agreement that we. Uh, I don't know the details. I don't remember the details, but I. Roughly, it is. We are. We promise that we're not going to get involved in the political movements anymore and things like that. Only, only then we can continue with our work. So there were a couple of actresses who would never sign those agreements. So they are out of business. They yeah. cannot be in the movie business anymore. But she passed away with that, with her uh, beliefs in in her own heart. Mm. So there, there were there were actresses I know at least two of them. So the one of them passed away. The other one I'm not sure about her. So they mm. they would not they would not sign. They would not sign. But we had to sign, and then we continue with our career. But some are very strong-minded, and they would they would never say we're sorry. Right, right. Uh, we spoke last year on this podcast to Kenneth Wong, who is a Burmese living in San Francisco, quite well known for his work in poetry and books and um, music and and movies as well. He's been a commentator of uh, Burmese cinema in many different ways. One of the things that he said in our interview with him was commenting on the tragedy of how many brilliant artists and filmmakers and storytellers there were in Myanmar who were simply not able to tell the stories they wanted to tell, whether they were through short films or feature length or TV shows or documentaries or whatever else. They just simply, they they could not, they 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 were not able to, they lacked the freedom in the country to be able to uh, to tell a more dynamic and truthful story of what their vision was and what they were seeing, which is what artists do. I heard about a poet. He expressed his um, unhappiness in his uh, one of his poems, and he was put into the jail. So that's what I heard about. So some people were not very happy about the situations and Pol the political situations in Myanmar. So they try to express, you know, their unhappiness with their words, but they were arrested and then they, he had to stay in the jail. But now he he is, he, he passed away already. Mm -hmm. Right. And how about for yourself? Were there, were there times that you wanted to go a certain way with a topic or a a role, and you were not able to to proceed in that direction based on censorship. To tell you the truth, at that time, I my mind was not that um, independent and strong like right now. Hmm. So I was just most of the time I was just following the directions from the director. So I was just I was just doing my job and did whatever they asked me or they asked me to how how to portray so but in, in right now i i will be very different than before but at that time i was i i i i i'm also one of the i'm also like one of the a lot of people over there we don't know how to express our own feelings but some some very brave people like that poet they they express their feelings, but um, I was not that brave. At the that time. reminds me of the expression you used with your father of uh, if the the water is leaking, you have to fill it up. It sounds similar to the uh, to that mindset of of just uh, which I think is probably true of many of us in the societies yeah. we live in. The conditioning that we uh, we we just kind of fit into the the, the pattern and the the structure of what that society is, and only with greater 
work do we start to question things that haven't been examined before? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people. And still these days, I think some people cannot come out and express their feelings, even though they are not agree with what is going on around them, but they are, they are used, so used to, you know, being shut off. So some are still quiet right now, but some, some very brave people, they show their, you know, emotions and protests, you know, the, the, the coup and all that kind of stuff. Mm, right. So it's really interesting because you, you said just a moment ago that the kind of um, bravery, I don't, I don't remember the exact words you use, but the sense of like bravery and, and speaking out and, and firmness, that these qualities you have now were not qualities that you had during your 20 years as a movie actress. And so that begs the question, what changed? What was the period of waking up? What was the transformation that you went through where you suddenly realized first of all, what was happening in your society? And second of all, having the courage to be able to speak out against that? What what changes did you go through for that to happen? I think um, experience and living, living in this country did that to me too, I think, because here you, you have the freedom of speech, so you you know and then you can express your feelings openly and then also i can see what is right and what is wrong right now and a lot of um innocent people were pushed away their own home and they have nowhere to live nothing to eat a lot of sadness so I really feel I'm with them and I, I, I feel really sorry for them. So, and, and then that's why now I'm ready to speak out and, you know, oh, don't think about oh, what will happen to me. And, but uh, to say the truth, uh, I'm also here. So I have the chance to do that. So some people over there, even though they may want to express their feelings, their lives are depend on their, you know, their movement. So they, they do not dare to say things. So I, I understand them. If, even though people don't want to, don't try to say the right things, I can understand their, their fear. So I won't blame them. Yeah, I, I, I understand. I hear them. I hear their feelings. But me, I'm more independent and I can express my feelings here and also the age and experience. I think that changed me into this, you know, this me right now. Mm, so you feel it was going to live in America and being in a freer environment that gave you the courage to be able to speak up and the awareness to be able to know what to speak up about. Is that right? And also, what what um, people should the you know the should get the chances and freedom and you know the right of the people you know the right of the human beings what the human beings should have what rights they should have you know so that's all now I I can see all of them so but mm. over there people are always you know controlled by the military so they can say things they can say certain things they can do certain things they always have to be scared you know things like that so i i feel really really sorry for them and what did bring you to america when you came over what year was it and what what brought you over here it was in the first time i came here was 19 89. That was a visit. So I stayed here for about five months in San Francisco mm. and I left. And the second time here was I was following my uh, fiance, who is my husband. So I came here 
to to meet with him and to get ma- married so and then since then i i've been here so it's been almost it, the second time i came was in end of the 92 so it was the the clinton era clinton was mm. you know getting the position here so it's been almost 30 years now mm. and when you were in myanmar you didn't really do much to to speak up. It was really coming to America and living in this society that started to give you that awareness and courage to begin to act. Is that right? Yeah, as well as um, when I was younger, I kind of felt um, shy and scared and think, oh, if I say this, what people would think this and that and things like that. But now I'm more matured and also I had a lot of experience so i'm more i am uh, braver and you know i i can express my feelings more uh, uh, freer than before i think right and so since you've then come to america and you've been speaking out more can you give an example of the ways you've been engaging because someone like you as a an exile from Myanmar now living in the West, you're you're not just any exile. You're you're very well known by a certain generation for your two decades in the industry. So you do have something of a platform and a voice that can stand out. And so since you've then taken on that role, in what ways and and in what what have you expressed to be able to find that voice and to speak out? After 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 seeing the you know all the um things in Myanmar so i i felt that um we need to speak out we cannot stay quiet you know and we also i also want to help people over there so we started doing the getting involved in the fundraising events and also i was First thing, I got involved in doing some news translations and narrations for Myanmar media outlets and also started supporting fundraising efforts. And then when he, when my husband started writing the Sunny Day musical, um, he wrote it in English to communicate with the theater's technicians. And while, while he's learning the typing in Burmese, I translated what he's written into Burmese and and then later he did it on his own. So mm-hmm. and also I wrote the lyrics of the all the new songs involved in the sunny day. So there are no Western cover songs, only the Myanmar songs. And then we also created some new songs for the musical as well. So and then uh, according to the story, my husband and I discussed the lyrics back and forth until we got them right for the scenes, things like that. And I also played a Myanmar poet character in that musical as well. Tell us what that Sunny Day musical is. That's something that you and your group have been working on quite a bit since the coup as an advocacy, awareness, fundraising project in the U.S. Uh, tell us a bit about what that is. Yeah, it is. Um, it is the Sunny Day musical is based on the coup and the events of Myanmar Spring Revolution. It highlights how the coup transformed people and the country. And the theme of the musical is national unity. So we open with the unity and we end with unity and hope for the future. So. And then I I like to say we we the feelings to towards the Burmese people we are united with the majority of Myanmar people. We rejected the coup and the imprisonment of leaders and elected officials and a lot of people over there. And we rejected the torture and the killings of the all the civilians. So that's why. So we we perform the Sunny Day musical 
last year in March. And then um, a lot of people um, were supported. And also we are going to play, perform again in um, 29th of this month in San Francisco. And later we are going to, we are trying to... Um, Post it uh, on the with in in the, in the video form, you know, so people can also people can watch it. Well, it seems there's something fitting in you having acted under such censorship censorship for two decades in Myanmar, and being constricted, and now suddenly being able to use your profession and use your acting skills with full free expression being able to say and do exactly as you like in that creative medium yeah and then there is there was a one one situation not so long ago happened so we posted a part of my poet poetry you know reading on youtube and then i one day i realized my voice was all cut off so there was silent i was saying things but you cannot hear my voice anymore so somebody did that. They are still doing it, even though we are here. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. What has been your thoughts on seeing the military coup from February 2021 as someone who lived through successive coups and military regimes and uh, lack of freedoms and violence against ethnic minorities and everything else, having lived through all of that and then being able to see this blossoming, tentative, democratic transition, what were your feelings on seeing the coup after it developed? In the beginning, I was not sure how to really respond and felt, feel, but later, more and more, you know, things happen. And then we saw a lot of uh, protesters were crushed. And um, so at that time, you know, the country was somewhat open already after the Aung San Suu Kyi. But now they're trying to move it into the previous situation all along, you know, so, so in the beginning, I was not sure what to expect. And then later, the more, you know, killings are involved and the more, you know, people are put into the prisoners and all that. So we, we didn't feel it was okay anymore. So then we started to try to help them in any way we can. That's how we got involved. And I, I, I think it is not fair for the people in Myanmar, you know, to, 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 to be um, involved in things like that every day. And then it, it's now it's already two years and it is still, you know, people don't have peace. And a lot of people are in very hardship, you know, they don't have their jobs, no income, you know, they don't know what to, you know, what to do, how to eat, how to support, things like that. And then I think in this time, people don't have that kind of hardship. That's what I, what we believe. So that's why we try to, we like to help them as much as possible in, mm any ways we can, you know, that's how we involve into these things. Hmm, right. Uh, our platform evolved into being able to respond to the developments with the coup and the resistance movement. Initially, we were doing more interviews and explorations of Buddhism and meditation and, and monkhood and the spiritual path. I am a true Buddhist. So I am a traditional Buddhist, but later I, I believe, I really believe into the Buddhism and I also did meditations. I went to the meditation camps a couple of times and then 
I believe, you know, I believe in Buddhism and I support it. And he, here as well, you know, I, I try to meditate as much as possible, but these days I, I'm out of um, practice, so I need to go back do that. But um, Which, I believe I believe in Buddha. Yeah, that that do see the do see the shot. Hmm. And which teachers or lineages or techniques of meditation did you did you study under in Myanmar? In Myanmar, long time ago, I went to the Mogo Mogo uh, Vipassana. Mm -hmm. Saka. And then mm -hmm. here, I don't know if you heard about him, the Miao Wu Siado. Yeah. So mm -hmm. he, he came from Burma quite often and then did the meditation camps. So I, I, I try to be there all, all the time. So, but these days he, 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 he hasn't been here, but I hope he, he'll be here soon and I will go and get into the camp again. So your primary practice lineages have been first Mogok and then Miao, is that right? Yeah, Miao, Miao Siado. And how how would you? Do, I'm I'm familiar with Mogok. I I I know about the the emphasis on the Parisamuppada and the law of dependent origination, the practice of the, the emphasis of theory of Mogok Sayada. I'm very familiar with Miao in terms of his his presence and the, the the reverence that people have for him. Some of my close friends speak very highly of him. I don't really know so much about his actual meditation instructions and lineage and technique. So can can you share a bit about what ex, uh, how exactly Miao Seda teaches, perhaps how it's different from Mogok and how you've learned to practice how you've learned to practice meditation under Miao, how how you have learned to follow his instructions and what exactly he teaches in terms of the 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 meditation practice. I think it is very similar to the Mogo method and Miao Siado is also uh, he also went to the Mogo Vipatanasaka mm. and also as well as the Mahasi. So mm -hmm. he he learned from both uh, both the monks, but his method is I think very similar to Mogo. First, you need to you need to concentrate on your breathing first, and then when your mind is kind of um, still, then you just watch what is happening in your mind or in your body, or you know. So you just need to be aware of what is going on in your mind or in your, the, the, the more, um, you know, the, you just need to be aware of what is happening. If you think about something, you just need to be aware. And if you feel something, you just need to be aware of what is happening, how you are feeling, things like that. So, and you have peacefulness in your mind, but I'm still trying. So, I I I I don't think I get anything yet, but I need to try. That's my goal. That's my hmm. goal, big biggest goal of <laughs> my life. Yeah. Because That's great. I don't want to I don't want to come back hmm. to anywhere. Not even mm -hmm. not even the you know, in the as a people or as a better life. I don't want I don't want but I'm not sure, but I need to at least try. I need to try very hard. That's my goal. Mm, to get I, the, we, the forever peacefulness, to find the forever peacefulness. That's that's wonderful. I wish you all the, the success in that effort and diligence. Uh, being someone who is a self-proclaimed true Buddhist, traditional Buddhist, who follows meditation instructions of Mogok and Miao, two of the very big traditions, meditative traditions in Myanmar. What have been your thoughts of the role of the Sangha and the monks in the last several decades? Uh, first of all, we know that there's been nationalist monks movements who have supported government propaganda and anti-Islam and, and other kinds of uh, hateful speech that has gone on. And we've also not seen a very heavy monk response 
in the democracy movement in this current revolution. There certainly have been some that have stood out and have have, have really done quite a bit to support it at their own peril and, and sacrifice. But there hasn't been a really great involvement. And so what have been your thoughts as, as someone who believes so much in the Buddhist teachings and is a very devout Buddhist as well as meditative practitioner? What have been your thoughts and observations as you watch the form that the Burmese monkhood has taken over the past several decades? I think Tanga is, for the Buddhism, we need Tangas. We definitely, definitely need Tangas. And then in, in the, before there was some um, yellow, yellow rope revolutions or something, you know, there were a lot of Tangas involved in some of the protests and some are, some were shot. So I don't know if there are some uh, casualties of Tangas, but probably. And these days, some of the Tangas are still doing the protest in smaller township. I can see it, see them on the Instagram. And no, not the Instagram, Telegram, you know. But some of the some of the monks, like for example, Miao Usiado, he is not involved in this protesting. He is saying he is just teaching the mindfulness and to get the you know the our goal you know the forever peacefulness he is but at one point at one point i think he was detained to question to to to, to question about the, his involvement in the politics but he 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 never did any of the politics so he was and later he was free and so there are monks some monks I don't really understand but some monks even though they are not really saying things there were hints there were hints about them saying do good things and good things will happen to you if you do bad things bad things will happen to you things like that some are giving some hints of stopping the you know stop to stop doing bad things it's kind of hard if you live over there because mm. there is no freedom of speech sure there is no freedom of involvement in the politics right. you know so they had to i think they had to be um careful about you know Absolutely. What, what they do yeah mm. but some are some uh, some people don't like about some very famous monks because they are uh, involved with the, the military people. So some people say bad things about them. So for for us, we we don't know how what stage they are in. You know, if they are, you know, the stage that they gain, they they attain the you know the um, I don't know how to say that. Some already attained some stage. If you say bad things about them, we believe that it's not not very good for you. So some people do do not dare say mm. things, say bad things about some monks. Some mm. are still, some are doing it right now. So I can see, I can see those uh, in in Facebook. But I, I, I am stay. I'm staying away from that. I don't want to say bad or good things about the monks, but the monks' rules are very important in Buddhism and as well as political, I believe. But they, I think they have to be careful. They are being mm. careful, I think. So that's why some are not getting involved. But some are still, I can see some monks doing the protests in some of the small towns. We talk about the possibility of the military trying to insert propaganda into the religion and the monkhood and uh, their sermons and their actions. It reminds me of your time in Myanmar cinema. And of course, the the cinema is a, a very effective vehicle in any country 
to be able to get out messaging. And I think even in our country, in our Hollywood, there have been instances where certain types of propaganda or messaging or whatnot has gone into some of the movies at the behest and encouragement of of, of our government. And so I'm wondering in your 20 years in the Myanmar film industry, did were you aware of or did you encounter any times where movie scripts or roles or messages or anything were really just a cover for some kind of military propaganda that wanted to use the medium of film to be able to put out some kind of messaging that they desired? Yeah, there were some, uh, there were some, um, military uh, supporting movies as well. Some are produced by, I think, not directly, but indirectly produced by the military-related people. So the, the, those movies were there. Yeah, people people knew about it. But there were also good uh, good military movies as well because... Um, the, there were like um, Japanese Revolution and things like that. So they 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 also make movies like that. Events from a long time ago to to get our independent, you know. So mm -hmm. things like that happen. But these days, but people don't uh, really. Even though they do the propagandas, I don't think people really buy that. Mm. They know they know how how the military is. Now they are proving it mm. more. Yeah. Great. Right. Mm. Well, this has been a really great conversation. I think those are all the questions I have really covering your your life, your career, your activism now. It's been great to hear about all that. Of course, your your practice and, and meditation and Buddhism. Uh, before we close, is there anything else you'd like to talk about that we haven't brought up yet? Uh, I think we covered a lot. And I just want to uh, thank you. Thank you so much for all that you've been doing for Myanmar and Buddhism. And also thank you for your interest in the Sunny Day musical. We want to present a special opportunity for donors who are committed to our show. While we want to stress that we greatly appreciate donations of any size, larger donations, of course, are particularly helpful. For that reason, we're encouraging donors with means to consider sponsoring a full episode for a one-time donation of $350 or more. Donations in this category can include a dedication, if you'd like, to a person or organization, and as well as a quotation or expression. Or your generous donation could be anonymous as well. The choice is yours. In either case, it would give you the satisfaction of knowing that you enabled at least one more episode to be produced for the benefit of the people of Myanmar who have suffered so much at the hands of the military. If you would like to join in our mission to support those in Myanmar who are being impacted by the military coup, we welcome your contribution in any form, currency, or transfer method. Your donation will go on to support a wide range of humanitarian and media missions, aiding those local communities who need it most. Donations are directed to such causes as the Civil Disobedience Movement, CDM, Families of Deceased Victims, Internally Displaced Person IDP Camps, Food for Impoverished Communities, Military Defection Campaigns, Undercover Journalists, Refugee Camps, Monasteries and Nunneries, Education Initiatives, the purchasing of protective equipment and medical supplies, COVID relief, and more. We also make sure that our donation fund supports a diverse range of religious and ethnic groups across the country. We invite you to visit our website to learn more about past projects as well as upcoming needs. You can give a general donation or earmark your contribution to a specific activity or project you would like to support, perhaps even something you heard about in this very episode. All of this humanitarian work is carried out by our nonprofit mission, Better Burma. Any donation you give on our Insight Myanmar website is directed towards this fund. Alternatively, you can also visit the Better Burma website, betterburma.org, and donate directly there. In either case, your donation goes to the same cause in both websites except credit card. You can also give via PayPal by going to paypal.me slash betterburma. 
Additionally, we can take donations through Patreon, Venmo, GoFundMe, and Cash App. Simply search Better Burma on each platform and you'll find our account. You can also visit either website for specific links to these respective accounts or email us at info at betterburma.org. That's Better Burma, one word, spelled B-E-T-T-E-R-B-U-R-M-A dot org. If you would like to give it another way, please contact us. We also invite you to check out our range of handicrafts that are sourced from vulnerable artisan communities across Myanmar, available at alokacrafts.com. Any purchase will not only support these artisan communities, but also our nonprofit's wider mission. That's Aloka Crafts, spelled A-L-O-K-A-C-R-A-F-T-S, one word, alokacrafts.com. Thank you so much for your kind consideration and support. Oh, ba, yaranan, da, da, yaranan, 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 da,